What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for being a part of the Tattoo Historians Digital Conference today. Thank you to everyone who's been with us all day. And thank you to those tuning in for the first time. We, we really appreciate it. And we've come to our last presenter of the day. And uh, Taylor Lewis is our final presenter here at the Digital Conference. Taylor earned his MA at the University of Southern Mississippi. I'm happy to have Taylor join us because he was to present this paper at the uh, Society for Military Historians Conference, which was canceled and I was going to be at anyway. So I was going to meet you there, there Taylor, one way or another. Well, that would have been fun. <laughs> In the years following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, American troops contended with insurgent forces resistant to conventional tactics. General David Petraeus, along with other military experts, addressed the need for new strategies with the publication of War Fighting Publication 3-33.5 in 2006. The manual laid out methods by which American troops should quell insurgent threats in Iraq and Afghanistan. This presentation is concerned with how the Marine Corps enacted the policies of 3-33.5 in the district of Sangin in Helmand Province between 2010 and 2012. The tenets of this new manual were tested in the years following President Barack Obama's commitment of 30,000 additional troops in 2009. Helmand province was under the combat control of the Marines from 2010 to 2014. And during the first two years, operations in the district of Sangin closely followed principles laid out in 3-33.5. Although the withdrawal of American units in 2014 did not bode well for the Afghan National Army or ANA, in Helmand, the period in question proved the ability of the Marine Corps to effectively carry out doctrinal principles. Through an examination of command chronologies and oral history interviews, this presentation highlights the process in which official counterinsurgency policy was put into action in the field. And as we said beforehand, before we went live, this is a very interesting talk because we're blending somewhat current events to some of us and the history field which is which is fantastic and taylor i'm really happy to have you on here to do this presentation and i give you the floor my man all right thank you john it's great to be here and i appreciate the opportunity um i'd like to begin um with a little story so in the spring of 2012 corporal nicholas selecki of the first battalion seventh marines arrived in Sangin district now Nick's job, along with his platoon, was to train members of the Afghan National Army, or the ANA. And Nick's first encounter with the ANA occurred when he, was, he had just arrived, and he was standing outside a small patrol base in Sangin. And a group of ANA soldiers approached the base in this old beat-up Ford Ranger. You had a guy in the back mounting this old Dishka machine gun. It's not, it wasn't really bolted in very well, so the machine gun's hopping all over the place. Um, and the guys stop right in front of the base and they get out. And one of the guys gets out of the truck and reaches into the back and pulls out this garbage bag filled to the brim with marijuana. The guy looks at Nick, gives him the thumbs up and says, double good, and enters the hut. And that was the last time Nick saw those guys until they finished their smoke break, which was like three or four days long. So that story was one of the things that really got me wondering, what is this counterinsurgency thing all about? How did Marines go about interacting with Afghan soldiers and Afghan civilians? And so as I was conducting more and more research, I came across the field manual that was published in 2006 under the direction of General David Petraeus. And so for my research, what I did was I I looked at command chronologies and oral histories um, at the Marine Corps archives in Quantico, Virginia. And I looked at two specific areas within Helmand province, which is a Southern province in Afghanistan. I looked at the town of Marja and I looked at the district of Sangin. And so today I would like to present the Sangin chapter of my thesis, which is titled Sangin Grad. So Sangin district is located in the Northeastern portion of uh, Helmand province and it straddles the Helmand River. So also going through Sangin is Route 611, which connects the district of Sangin to the Helmand uh, provincial capital of Lashkargah. So 
The United States really wanted to control that route because it was a primary way for the Taliban to send foreign fighters throughout Sangin and into Lashkagar and other areas of Helmand province. And it also connected Sangin to an important hydroelectric dam, which provided electricity not only for the district of Sangin, but for a million other people in Helmand province. And so what I would like to do is show how the principles that were outlined in this field manual correlated to action on the ground. So what I'm going to do is highlight a few units that served in Sangin between 2010 and 2012. So prior to the American involvement there, Sangin was largely under the command control of the British military. Now from 2006 onward to when the British withdrew, one third of the total number of KIA that happened in Afghanistan happened in Sangin district. So this was a highly contested area. And so the first American unit to arrive in Sangin, uh, they arrived in July 2010, and that was the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. Now, counterinsurgency largely occurs in phases. Um, if you do any research into the subject, you'll often find, especially when uh, modern counterinsurgency is talked about, you'll find the uh, aspects of clear, hold, and build. Now, the 3-7, their mission was to establish a perimeter around the district of Sangin and to kind of weed out the large pockets of Taliban fighters that were in the area. So when the 3-7 arrives, what they do is they establish different points surrounding the district. They also go into the area, which is called the Green Zone, which is next to the Helmand River, where a lot of the farmers are located in which there, were, there was a lot of Taliban activity. So they would do things like setting up ambush positions, set up their own small patrol bases. They would also try to clear improvised explosive devices or IEDs with tanks with large forks on them. And another company, I Company, was also established to the other side of the river. So not in Sangin, but to the west of it. And they established what were pretty much foxholes. And they what they did was prevented large numbers of Taliban fighters from entering um, the province. And so that's what they primarily did for the majority of their deployment was to hinder large groups of Taliban from entering um, the province. So another battalion, Battalion 3-5, um, arrived in October of 2010. Now, this deployment was focused primarily on establishing a constant presence. And one of the most important tenets of the manual, which I'll read here, is addresses that, that concept. So it reads, a Marine force assigned an area security mission during a coin operation executes it as a combat operation. The force establishes and maintains measures to protect people and infrastructure from hostile acts or influences while actively seeking out and engaging an insurgent force. So basically what they're doing is making their presence known. And this is done by patrolling, constant patrols, day in, day out. You're out there, boots on the ground, making your presence known to people. Um, just a little bit of data. One platoon um, in K Company of the, of the battalion, in the six months that they were there, they conducted 400, 400 patrols and were engaged 171 times. So... That right there illustrates just the degree to which the Taliban was active and how and how much they wanted to hold on to the district, but the Marines were determined to make their presence known to the civilians. One of the interviews that I used for this chapter um, was Nick Anderson, a Marine from Michigan who served with a 3-5. And he describes a typical day in Sangin. They would patrol, and a typical patrol would last about two hours, and in that time, they would move an average of 50 feet. It was a turtle's pace. But they're trying to, you know, win favor of the civilians. And as far as the civilians were concerned, the Taliban and the civilians were connected. You know, you, it wasn't always clear if someone was a civilian by day and a Taliban by night or what was going on. So the Taliban had a lot of connections with the civilian populations. And what they would try to do is pass disinformation about the Marines. You know, for example, Nick was told that, you know, the civilians thought that the 3-5 was going to come in, harm civilians, 
cut the heads off of children and things like that, which were obviously not true. But unless they made their presence known, they wouldn't be able to prove otherwise. And so one of the things that changed the more the three five went out is that the civilians started to they started to be a little more active. They would go through markets at the beginning of the deployment. They wouldn't see many civilians, but towards the end, you know, they were interacting much more with them. So in the summer of 2011, another battalion deploys to Sangin, and it's the 1st Battalion, 6th Marines. Now, what I'd like to highlight with the 1-6 is the idea of shuras. Now, what shuras were were meetings between Afghan village elders and Marine officers. So a typical shura for the 1-6 included, you know, you, you find a building, you have village elders come in, you have the officers meet them, you know, the, the elders would express their concerns that they had about the Marines. They would always, they would also express different things that they needed done. Like for example, if they needed more access to water, they would request that the Marines construct, um, you know, a well or something like that. They would also, you know, elicit the help of different civil affairs teams within the United States military. And so it was kind of a, it was kind of a back and forth where the Marines could kind of make their intentions known and it see to the needs of the civilians. But as these were going on, the Taliban is trying to disrupt. So it wasn't uncommon for a Shura to be going on and the Taliban are trying, you know, they know that this is going on and they're trying to attack the building in which it is going on in. So what would happen is that the Marines would come and establish perim a perimeter so that their officers could go in and talk with the civilians. And these, this is a very important concept within the manual is that you need to be there with the civilians, you need to be on the ground, you need to talk to them and you need to listen to them. But this means that the Marines take on an additional degree of risk. You know, in traditional warfare, you're able to use the tools of modern combat, such as drones, aircraft, etc. But in this kind of situation, you can't because you need to be aware of civilian casualties. You need to make sure that you're not doing anything to influence them to join with the Taliban. So in late 2011, we have the 3-7 come back again, but this time they're under new leadership. They're under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Seth Folsom. Now, before Folsom arrives, or before Folsom's battalion arrives in Sangin, Folsom himself visits the district now, he's doing that because typically when you have a change in units in an area, there's differences. So, you know, one unit that comes into an area might disagree with how, how the previous unit did things. Um, and so there might be a little bit of a, a jet lag there or a difference there. Um, and that could prove detrimental to a counterinsurgency operation. So what Folsom was doing is to try to get to know the battalion's leadership to know how they did things so that once the 3-7 arrived, they could continue that wheel from going in, you know, in a similar way. So once the 3-7 gets there, what they're doing is they're, they're maintaining the same operational cadence, they're interacting with civilians, you know, they're giving candy to kids, they're keeping in mind of how they act so that they're not making anybody you know, join the Taliban if they can help it. But one of the things I'd like to highlight in this area also is um, the presence of drugs in Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan is one of the leading producers of poppy in the world, which is used for opiates, etc. Now, most of the farmers in Helmand and in Sangin in particular, they're poppy farmers. Now, poppy is the Taliban's primary method of getting financial support. So what the United States wanted to do is they wanted to incentivize farmers in Sangin to grow something else. So they would give them, you know, monetary incentive to grow things such as wheat or corn. And herein lies one of the kind of the issues with counterinsurgency is that there really wasn't anything that could be done to give equal compensation um, to farmers that grew something besides poppy. I mean, poppy earned them way more money than wheat or corn would. So what they did was they gave, they left it open, you know, farmers could choose to switch if they wanted. Eradication, poppy eradication was something that happened on a small scale. 
there were several thousand hectares of poppy that were destroyed, but there was also a 10,000 acre increase between 2011 and 2012. So within that situation, you kind of choose the lesser of two evils. You know, while you don't want, want drugs going out, you know, you don't want to push these farmers into the arms of the Taliban. So in certain cases, and this is particularly apparent in the Marja chapter of my thesis, you can see that some officers would try to leave open back channels to where some of the poppy could get out um, and maybe like the main routes were cut off. So there was, there was still some of that stuff going out because it doesn't seem to have, there doesn't seem to have been much of a solution um, to contend with the poppy, the poppy issue. And when Marines tried to do anything to remove the poppy, you know, this a poppy field could be completely empty. It could be a quiet, serene. But as soon as a bulldozer tried to go into that area, you know, it just, it, it's Hollywood. I mean, it, the Taliban just open up. So there is a staunch resistance to the removal of poppy. Some of the other things that occurred, especially when the 3-7 was there, you had female engagement teams, um, which were called uh, FETs. Now, FETs are consisted of primarily female Marines, and so what they do is they go into areas, you know, similar to Shura's, and they talk with women and children. So they try to connect with the families on a different level than maybe the male officers would. Um, and actually, in December of 2011, um, an FET conducted a Shura with some children in Sangin at a forward operation operating base Jackson, which was the main American base in Sangin. Now, what they did was they educated women and children on the dangers of the Taliban, the dangers of improvised explosive devices, and they educated them on the sort of the objectives of the Afghan security forces and the Marines. And they also put on, you know, a little puppet show for the kids um, to kind of make the information more accessible. And they also uh, played sports with the kids. They played a game of soccer with them as well. So the important thing there is that despite the fact that the Taliban is still active in this area, they are still making a concerted effort to interact with the civilians and protect them when possible. And this all lines up with the tenets that are clearly evident in this field manual. Now, one of the most important aspects about counterinsurgency, as we alluded to at the beginning of this, is the training of the ANA. Now, when Nick Selecki arrives, he is positioned in a small patrol base with 12 Marines and 23 Afghan National Army soldiers. And that's his job. You know, go out there, patrol with the ANA to get them to be able to essentially take the reins when the American military withdraws. And that is set to occur in 2014. But unfortunately, this process isn't the smoothest. I mean, like I mentioned before, drug use is rampant in the ANA. Um, officers, there are many incompetent officers. There are competent officers in the ANA, but there are many officers in the ANA who got their commissions by going to Kabul and paying for it. So there's a lot of, you know, the political connections there that are getting its way into the ANA that are making it really difficult for the Marines to do their jobs. Um, there's also cases of child molestation as well um, in the Afghan National Army. Um, in addition, there is also a a lack of enthusiasm um, from, you know, the ground level soldiers, you know, with the drug use, you know, there's kind of a lack of a desire to go out on, on patrol. And when they do go out on patrol, um, when the Marines accompany them, you know, it's it's really hard for the Marines to let them take the reins. They do on occasion, but it's, it's a very stressful situation because, you know, when you're being led by a group of people who don't really know what they're doing, you know, it makes your job a lot more riskier. Um, so, you know, that was always a point of stress for the Marines that were there. Now, one of the other things that was evident um, with the Marines experience, in particular Selecki's when I spoke with him, is that there were green on blue attacks. Now, what a green on blue attack is, is basically when the Taliban infiltrates the Afghan, the Afghan National Army. Now, Mullah Omar, um, who has since been killed, but he was the leader of the Taliban and the founder of the Taliban. He had called upon all those who followed him and people who were in the government of Kabul to infiltrate the Afghan National Army to kill government troops and American troops. 
So in 2012 alone, throughout Afghanistan, 61 um, Afghan soldiers and American soldiers were killed and 81 were wounded in these instances of Taliban infiltration. So you can imagine, you know, being, you know, on the ground in the ANA and in the, in the Marines that you have to be concerned with not only to the Taliban, but you have to, you know, be on guard all the time because you don't know if, you know, somebody in your own unit is going to turn out to be, you know, a Taliban infiltrator. So those were all interesting things, you know, that I found in that. So all of this stuff, you know, the point of my paper is to show that all of these things that are working against the Marines, you know, you have the, the 2014 looming withdrawal date and you have the lack of enthusiasm with the Afghan National Army and their ultimate failure to properly prevent the Taliban from taking over once the Americans leave. All of this kind of overshadows um, the fact that the Marine Corps executed their counterinsurgency operations by the book. So my question was, is that was this policy able to be implemented in the field? And the answer to that is yes. But unfortunately, there were factors beyond the control of the Marines, um, beyond their control that were sort of actively working against them. And so, you know, once the Americans withdraw in 2014, they um, the Taliban quickly starts to retake the territory and the, you know, the battle for the heart of Afghanistan even continues, continues today. So. Thank you. And I'm ready to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Taylor. I really appreciate that. Uh, the one thing that uh, I did mark down while you were talking was when you were talking about the poppies and uh, poppy fields. And all I wrote was quagmire <laughs> because oh, yeah. you, you destroy the poppies, you anger the civilian population. You keep the poppies, you help fund the Taliban. Right. Yeah. And, and one of the difficulties, I mean, any of the points that I explore in this project can be expanded on in a book of its own. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was talking to a colleague, you know, especially about the poppy issue, I mean, that that certainly is a, a quagmire, quagmire because it's their it's the farmer's primary source of income. So how can you mm -hmm. how can you provide them with an alternative source of income that's going to come even close to what they're making? You know, but you also have to worry about the Taliban as well. So it is, it's definitely one of those difficult things. And I encourage anybody who, if they're interested in this topic, um, there was actually kind of a uh, a satirical movie that came out, I think, in 2016. It's called War Machine. It's got Brad Pitt. Mm. It's on Netflix, and it talks about Helmand Province in the, the same time that I'm, you know, addressing it. So and it and it expands on some of these issues, and it's and it's kind of funny too. So. <laughs> something worth checking out yeah i second that i've watched that and it's yeah yeah it's really good uh, when we first uh, opened up we talked about the issues with something that's pretty modern right seen as historical and the issues with research comes up and and kara points out did you run any struggles with interviewing because of an ethics issue or or three of the oral interviews i know that some people some soldiers and Marines who I've spoken to said, I can't go into that. It's still classified, obviously. But did you run into anything like that through your research? I didn't. Um, much of the information that I came across um, were things that I, I could find as well in like different news reports. I mean, they, things that that was alluded to. Um, there were certain things that I I was instructed. So a lot of the interviews that I used came from the Quantico archives. These were interviews conducted by military historians while these units were deployed. So this is information that's being given, you know, right after these events actually occurred. And so I was basically instructed to, you know, not give the names of any interpreters or things like that because there could be significant reprisals. Um, but in terms of, of classified info, um, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, I didn't really run into any issues. Um, in the past, I've given, uh, done some interviews um, with veterans from the Iraq war I mean, there were a couple of times where they asked me to turn my recorder off mm -hmm. and they, you know, told me some things that, you know, I'm not I'm not going to repeat here just because right. I don't think they, you know, they're classified. But I mean, neither of us were were too, too sure about that. So right. um, for this project, not so much. But, you know, if you do conduct research into these conflicts, you know, there might be, you know, those things that pop up. 
Right. It's almost, it's very important for researchers like post 1980 world to really under, from the military standpoint, to really understand, even from previous, even from the Vietnam War era, that you're going to have to understand not only how to conduct an oral interview properly and understand historical narrative, but you're also going to have to understand that uh, there are laws still in place that you can't talk about certain things. And if you even have it recorded, you're going to get in yeah. trouble. Big time. I, I said, I mean, like the historiography of these conflicts is it's still it's in it's still it's in, in its infancy. Excuse me. Wow. Um, mm. And in Afghanistan in particular, I mean, the area that I'm looking at was really when significant numbers of American troops began to arrive. I mean, in the early days of the conflict, I mean, we were primarily concerned with getting Al Qaeda um, and it sort of evolved from there, um, you know, in the 2005, 2006 era, a lot of what was going on there was basically hunting for Al Qaeda operatives. So they're looking for tier one targets. So I can only imagine telling the story of those years is going to be incredibly difficult because you're looking at, you know, tier one operators like Delta Force, SEALs, and it's really hard to find anything right. about those guys. Right. Yeah. And it's going to be tough for archivists, too, because everything is already digitized in a digital format with emails. And how do you get the emails? How do you get all the text messages? And it's it's a different world than it was if we were trying to compile compile stuff from, let's say, Vietnam. Um, you know, I mean, there, there's terabyte upon terabyte of information that's just sitting in archives. I mean, even, you know, when I looked at command chronologies for this project, you know, I might find a collection of interviews for 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. But if I go into the folder, you know, that folder for command chronolo chronologies, I might only find one that was written for a time period that they were training to deploy or after they just got back from deployment. So, you know, the written evidence and the oral history doesn't always line up. So that in itself is just one of the, you know, the, the struggles that historians are going to have in the years to come as they sort of try to crack this thing open. The other uh, little statement that I put goes into this one. Uh, Richard post, it would be interesting to do a comparison to Vietnamization and the efforts to boost the ANA. I actually wrote in my notes, ANA sounds a lot like the Arvin. Yeah. Vietnam. It really Absolutely. I mean, that that is definitely, I mean, that was, I almost did that instead. I mean, I was a little more interested in, in Afghanistan. And when I got to grad school, my mentor, uh, Andrew Wiest, who is a specialist in Vietnam, I was kind of like, should I do a comparative study? He's like, no, you can do Afghanistan if you want. And I said, okay, I'm going to do that. But a comparative study between Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, the ANA to the Arvin would be really interesting because, I mean, Afghanistan and Iraq is not the first time, especially as far as the Marine Corps was concerned, you know, that's not their first interact, you know, interaction with counterinsurgency. You right. know, they were doing that stuff in Vietnam with, you know, combined action, action platoons and villages and things like that. So there's definitely, you know, not only differences, but, you know, stark similarities as well. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to set a Vietnam vet down with a guy who was in Helmand and be like, you know, let's see the similarities in the two, because it sounds like there's going to be a heck of a lot of similarities. And hey, how want to go back to grad school. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you, you gotta go for that PhD, right? There yeah. You there you go. You can do a dissertation on that. It can be All a right. curative. <laughs> yeah, for Not sure. That I'm trying to make you do more work, but that could be yeah. interesting. Um, th how was? Uh, I want to give a shout out to Southern Miss here because I have friends at Southern Miss as well. That's how was your experience with Southern Miss? I mean, Southern Miss is a great place. I mean, the people that work in that history department are rock stars. I mean, the you know, not only, you know, I had and Dr. Andrew Weiss, Dr. Heather Sturr, Dr. Brian LaPierre, Dr. Su uh, Susanna Gurl, all helping me out with my project, but there are many more um, historians there that are, are working with, you know, they're working with their own stuff, which is amazing. And they're also working with some extraordinary grad students who are doing some pretty cool stuff of their, of their own. So um, it is kind of sad to be leaving. I'm going to miss those people, but uh, I'm sure, you know, if a lot of you follow, you know, the academic field of history, you're going to be hearing about um, a lot of these people if you haven't already. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, uh, Susanna Ural invited me down to check out the campus and then go to Vicksburg. So I got yeah. to make that a thing in the future because I'd right. love to visit and see the campus. 
So I think she suggested me for this talk. So shout yeah. out, Dr. Earl, if you're watching this. Thank you. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, Taylor, I really appreciate your time and appreciate this subject. We've gone all over the chronological map today with our okay. discussions, and that's what I really enjoy uh, doing. And congratulations on earning your MA from Southern Miss. Well, thank you. Thanks for the invite. This is fun. You're welcome, my man. Take care of yourself. Thank you, everyone in the comments section. Yeah, we'll, thank go, you. we'll go wrap through those here in the next 24, 48 hours. Get some comments, likes, or questions answered that we didn't get to go through here. That way you don't feel like you're left out of the process. But thank you all for that. Thank you for joining us throughout the day. And again, thank you, Taylor, for an awesome presentation. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks, Take everyone. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye -bye.